just share screen for you. Okay. So it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, last speaker, last but not least, um, Emanuela Pachuto, a postdoctoral fellow at VIB and KU Leuven in Belgium. Emanuela completed her bachelor's degree in molecular and cellular biology from the University of Rome, Tor Vergata, where her early years of research focused on translation inhibition in fragile X syndrome. She stayed at the University of Rome for her master's degree in cellular and molecular biology. And this is where she began her work on regulatory T cells and how PARP1 inhibition activates these cells. She then joined the cognitive neuroscience program at VIB and KU Leuven and completed her PhD under the mentorship of Claudia Bani and Bart de Struper. As a graduate student, she returned to researching Fragile X and focused on the contributions of CYF1, IP1, and APP processing. She was able to integrate her knowledge on neurodevelopmental disorders and T-cells as a postdoctoral fellow, now in the lab of Adrian Liston, and today she will present her work from her recent publication in Cell, entitled Microglia Requires CD4 T-cells to Complete the Fetal to Adult Transition. And with that, I'll leave it to Manuela. Hello, hello to everyone. I will share my screen. Okay, so hello to everyone and thank you very much for the invitation. It's very excited to present our data here to this audience today. So I will go to the data. So um, today I will present you our recent uh, st study on the microglia requirement um, to interact with these cells to complete the fetal to adult transition. So um, um, the, the lab of Adrian Liston has a long-standing uh, interest on the tissue-specific T cells, and now and now those cells that are normally in monoid part of the immune compartment they can have non-immune functions. So and and there we we started to 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 discuss and to to see how um, in the last year it was more and more clear how the T cells the T cells can can be found in the, in the brain, either in human than in mice, and how those cells can interact with the, with the CNS. And starting from a series of, of, of studies done on behaviors or impairment in neurogenesis of mice lacking T cells, we decided to study how the interaction between T cells and the central nervous system could, could be associated to also natural fun physiological functions in the brain. So this is the very first experiment that I've done actually when I joined the lab of Adrian, because I really wanted to see whether if I would somehow stimulate the brain of the mice, if this could somehow affect the immune system. So then I set up uh, an enriched environment um, experiment in which the mice were trained for five weeks, uh, starting from uh, very early stages of life. And, and then, um, after five weeks, I checked whether there was any change in the brain. And we were very excited when we see that training the mice in a, in a rich environment platform uh, led to an increase of either um, T-conventional or T-Rex uh, population. It really suggested that somehow there was an interaction between brain and immune compartments. So, as I said, there, were, there are already some studies showing that there are T cells in the brain, but in fact, we wanted to really verify whether this was still source of contamination or we were really looking at cells that were in the brain. So the very first experiment we did in this, in this direction was actually to inject mice with the anti cd 45 p antibody. This will label every T cell that would be in, um, that would be in, the, um, in the bloodstream, but will not go to the brain. And then we harvest the tissue and then we silate the cells and we look for the yeah, um, with uh, flow cytometry which cells were positive for the label and in fact to our surprise we found that only 40 percent of the cd4 in the brain were bound uh, to cd45 e so really showing that those cells could likely to be just in the brain parenchyma and then from this point we just took it on to to a series of experiments. And first of all, we, we asked James, a very talented scientist in the lab, to perform immunohistochemistry 
a really beautifully good show that there are in fact T cells in the brain parenchyma. And those are not associated to perivascular space and they are not associated with the vasculature. Actually, they lie in the parenchyma and um, they are associated in some cases even with the with microglia. We also check uh, where the dorsal dorsal could be found across uh, different brain regions. And in fact, indeed, we found cells in the meninges, but we also found cells in every brain region. We look at olfactory bulb, cortex, midbrain, hippocampus, cellulum, and so on. So from this point, we decided to go deep with the analysis and to perform a phenotyping of the cells, look at their kinetics, and to look also at TCR specificity. So first of all, um, we decided we decided to run a, a deep uh, with, um, sorry, um, an immunophenotyping on the cells. Um, and we use a bunch of markers that are commonly expressed by T cells, T conventional T rex. And we plotted here, um, and we, you can show here in this um, T snake plot how um, the brain T rex, they are clustered differently when compared to blood cells, really showing that the cells in the brain can express a different set of markers. And the same pattern was observed for T-conventional and T-Rex, although here, of course, numbers are much lower. So, and if you if we you look here at this histogram, you can appreciate as the cells in the, in the brain express a series of markers associated with activation, such as CD44, uh, ICOS, KRG1, uh, much higher than in the blood counterpart. And, and same for uh, resident, residency marker. And I have to say that across all our studies, CD69 really, really turned out to be um, a marker for residency that was consistently very highly expressed in all the resident population in the brain. Um, we also decided to, we were very lucky actually, we could establish um, a collaboration with the clinic and we had access to some uh, biopsies for human temporal lobes. And um, I isolated lymphocyte from those cells. And you can clearly see how we could find um, in the gray matter, for example, uh, either t rex or T-conventional. And again, we run the same analysis uh, by high parametric flow cytometry. And we look at the blood cells and meninges, gray matter and white matter. And again, we could confirm that those cells, they express activation marker and also, again, the residency marker CD69. Really showing, uh, altogether, this show that the, the cells in the brain that really um, show a, resi a residency phenotype that clearly distinguish them from the blood. And this really points out, points out against any source of contamination, that saying that, meaning that our cells are very unlikely to be a source of contamination coming from the blood. So here you can see um, a statistical analysis of the entropy of the t plots and looking at all the markers that have been analyzed and plotted here in this dendrogram. So you can clearly see how the brain tissue here in mouse, uh, both in mouse than in, uh, in brain, can cluster together, while blood cluster together with the meningi. Also ruling out the hypothesis that actually we were worrying that, worrying that together with our brain that we would have contamination of meningi. But this clearly showed that this is not the case. So after that, we decided to study the ontogeny of the cells. So in the lab, um, James uh, uh, set up a series of um, parabiosis analysis, parabiosis couple using mice that express CD45.1 and 0.2 to be able to follow up the cell coming from each individual mice. And we follow up the, the cell in the brain over different time points, up to 12 weeks. And we could see in, in each brain how the percentage of um, brain, um, oh, sorry, donor and, and host cell uh, was balancing. And indeed, you can clearly see here how already after a couple of weeks, even before, the blood easily reaches the 50-50 equilibrium, while the brain cells, they are slower in reaching the, the equilibrium between um, host and donor. On the other hand, you can also appreciate that when we look at CD69 positive cells, the, this equilibrium is, is reached much more slowly 
really suggesting that those cells take more time to leave the brain. And in fact, this is quantified here. So um, the residency time is quantified here, and you can clearly see that there are no major difference between T-Rex and the conventional. But being uh, a CD69 uh, positive, positive cell makes their dwell time much higher, up to seven weeks, actually. And what we could also appreciate is that the cells, when the cells enter in the brain, they actually slowly acquire the residency phenotype. This is clear with a few markers, but the CD69 was quite evident. You can see that as soon as the cell enter the brain, they do not expect much of the CD69, but up to eight weeks, this is um, at the same level of the host. So it was quite clear that when the cells enter the brain, then we'll acquire a resident, resident phenotype. And then, um, there was a very talented uh, bioinformatician in the lab and, and statistician. So he developed this, he, he applied the continuous time mark of chain model uh, to analyze all the parabiosis analysis that have been done. So, and he developed a flow diagram in which you can see the different population of cells. So the size of the circle represents the abundance. Uh, of each population, but there is independent when looking at brain and blood. And you can see the flow rate of the cells from the blood to the brain. And what is very clear is that um, the main source of the cells in the brain are actually the activated cells coming uh, from the blood. Although there is also a smaller percentages, percentage that of cells that is coming uh, from the naive pool in the brain. And then those cells will then turn into CD69 positive. You can also you can also see how the you can also appreciate how in the T-Rex uh, subset the the, the rate of conversion of activated cell into resident cells is much higher. So taking together, this really suggested us that the cells to enter the brain they need to be activated. But then how do we test that? So first of all, we asked whether the cells in the brain uh, have an active TCR. So whether they are able to, when, whether when they are in the brain, they are actually able to bind uh, an epitope. So to do that, we use the NUR77 GFT mice. This mice, uh, it was very handy tool because when TCR is activated, the cell express, the, express GFT. And this is, um, com um, is comparable to the, the strength of the TCR engagement. So and you can very well see here how in the um, how in the um, in the brain, the especially when looking at the CD69 positive cells, the conventional have almost no activation of their TCR. On the other way around, on the contrary, when we look at the uh, the T-Rex in the brain, they are they seem to be dependent upon brain expressed antigen to be a, to, to be in the brain, as most of them are activated in fact. So to further test our hypothesis of needed of activation um, to enter the brain, and and also then this would be different when looking at T-Rex and T-Rex. Uh, T-Rex and uh, T-conventional, we use the 2D2 mice. So the 2D2 mice express the TCR10 gene that uh, recognize uh, the neuronal uh, antigen MOG, while the OT2 mice, they express another TCR10 gene where they cannot buy any big infect in the cells as they recognize a non-self antigen, the ovalbumin. And what we could observe very nicely is that in the brain, in the brain of the 2D2 mice, where there is, um, where there is, uh, when the cell can in fact recognize a brain antigen, the cell fails to, to move to the brain. In fact, the, the proportion of cells in the brain is much lower when looking at the blood of the periphery, while the expansion of the TREG is much higher in the brain. So it's really suggesting that the TREGs need to respond to a self antigen to be in the brain. On the other hand, the OT2 mice, where there are no cells that will bind an antigen, either neither the CD, the T, sorry, the T conventional are able to enter the brain, or the the T-Rex, really suggesting that the cells need to be activated. 
and the these T Rex in, in, instead they really need to to recognize a self antigen. Just to complete this series of experiments, we also ask whether um, exposing the mice to having the mice uh, exposed to a, a wild microbiome will somehow activate the cells in the gut, in the periphery. And we ask whether activation of the cells in the gut would somehow influence their income in the brain. And indeed, this was the case, as we expected. So as you can see maybe here in panel B, the, the number of T-conventional and t -rex, of T-conventional and not much t -rex that enter in the brain, enter the brain was much higher really supporting our, our hypothesis that the peripheral activation is really a requirement for, for the cells to enter the brain. Obviously, after that, we really wanted to know why the cells are in the brain and what is, is their role, role, what are they doing. So we decided to take a series of approaches. So first of all, we look at spine morphology of the neurons. As establishing of, of a proper network in the brain is important is, is key for brain function. So, and disruption of spine uh, number and morphology has been shown in a series of, of diseases, of brain diseases. So what I did, mm, we use the Jingan um, technology that allows to, to deliver into the brain slices uh, a lipophilic dye. This will label uh, some of the neurons. The, and we could quantify the amount of, uh, of spines uh, and, their, and also look at their shape. So we could clearly see that the number of spines was increasing in, in an extent comparable with several neurodevelopmental diseases. And also the shape of the spine was affected. In fact, we had an increase in immature spine. And of course, um, we immediately thought that could, this could be linked to uh, a behavior uh, impairment, and especially to a cognitive impairment. So a few, not many behavioral tests were ever run in the MC class to knockout. So those mice, uh, in fact, they lack the CD40 cells, and um, they have been um, not much used, especially in uh, neurobiology. And, and we could confirm, in fact, that those mice, they have a decreased performance in the Morris water maze test. They also failed uh, in the probe test, uh, showing a, a decrease in the contextual memory. And next, we also test them for contextual fear conditioning, where the mice, they need to learn uh, that a certain environment is associated to a cube. Um, and they also need to learn that different context, they are not anymore associated to the cube. So while type mice, they are able to discriminate the context, while this was not possible in the mice lacking CD4. Uh, we also tested mice for anxiety behavior, as there was a lot shown about the connection between CD4 and depressive behavior or anxiety. And in fact, uh, we found that the mice spend more time in the corner. They Many of them were just uh, laying on the side. And also in the light dark, 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 dark test, they take more time uh, to enter in the light zone. And they also are deficient in when tested in the fourth wing test. They also, we also tested for social behavior. Uh, one of the tests considered to be kind of associated to social behavior is the nest building. However, uh, and here we have um, a deficit. However, other um, social behavior tests did not uh, show a social impairment. Of course, for us then, um, it was natural for us to think uh, that the interaction between microglia and T cells could be key for those impairments that we could see in, in the MC class to knockout mice. As, in fact, uh, microglia is involved in a synaptic pruning and uh, defective microglia are very well associated with anxiety, depression, learning deficit, and, and especially defect in the early stages of microglia are associated with this deficiency. Therefore, we decided to, to use the single cell sequencing approach to look at microglia in the wild type mice and in the mice missing the CD4 T cells. 
So here I'm showing you, I'm showing you the, the clustering of the cells that were sequencing. Sequence. We identified the microglia clusters and, and then compared the wild type and the knockout cells. And it was amazing for us to see how they could cluster differently. differently. So, and in fact, almost 70% of the cells in the MC class 2 knockout mice will cluster alone in this cluster that we identified as cluster 3. And we, we then analyzed the expression uh, with the full change in, in, several, in the genes uh, that, that were sequenced. And we could find that 87 of the genes were downregulated in the MC class 2 knockout. And many of them were associated to, uh, were linked to, were genes linked to uh, development and, and uh, uh, development and maturation of microglia. And the same thing, we also specifically looked at this cluster in fact and we could confirm the same result. So, so then uh, what we decided to do, uh, we, we in fact rule out that there was no association with known um, neurodegenerative diseases, neurodegenerative diseases. And then we look at the data set that, co with, that compare different uh, gene profiles at different stages of development of microglia. So if we could see that the, in fact, the genes that were downregulated uh, in our mice were normally associated to a prenatal stage of the macrobia. So this was very clear for us. I was not having the CD4 in the brain prevented those genes to be activated. It thus leaving the cells in a fetal state, preventing their transition into the adult stage. And in fact, this very well correlated with our spine phenotype, where we, we could find uh, an increase in immature spine, immature spine, really suggesting an effect in the, in the pruning of the spine. And in fact, and indeed also with the behavior of deficit, deficit we observed. Um, we also decided to, in fact, confirm um, the sequencing data uh, by QPCR in MC plus two knockout mice uh, and also in TCR knockout. Yes. TCR alpha knockout mice. So, and we selected the genes associated with the, with the developmental signature and we looked for them. And in fact, we found them decrease also by QPCR, but we also decided to take a next step. So we decided to use uh, a CD4 depleting antibody to delete CD4 from the brain at T5 and at three weeks old, in three weeks old mice. And we very nicely found that the decrease in the signature genes was only possible when the CD4 were depleted at early stages and not later in the development. Really saying that the time point in which uh, the presence of the T cells in a certain time window is really crucial. And then we also took a, a let's say, opposite or complementary approach. We seeded slices, brain slices with CD4 T cells, and indeed we could see that this induced an increase of the genes present in this signature list and suggesting this was more suggesting towards a possible T cell, uh, T cell contact mechanism but we wanted to check whether also T conventional media was having the same effect so we treated cell culture uh, microglia with media from T conventional T-rex and also with specific cytokines and indeed we found that Specifically, the media from the T-conventional was able to some extent to trigger an increase in the, um, in the genes uh, associated with the, the development. So I hope all together, oh, oh my God, sorry. I hope all together I, I could convince you um, that uh, the T-cells the are required for this transition of the fetal cells into the adult phenotype. And then um, going through the different points of the talk, so um, I've shown you that there are CD4 T cell residents in the in the healthy mouse brain. So and those cells have a residency uh, program that is started in situ and they and, and develop over the weeks where they start overexpressing the CD69 uh, marker and uh, the peripheral activation is required for entry into the brain and also that the cells can enter the brain around birth and actually just before birth. And in this stage, their entry could turn on the transcription of genes that are key 
for development of the microglia. And when this process is not possible anymore, there is synaptic pruning of defects occurring and deficit in the learning and the memory and the anxiety of the mice. So, and with this, uh, I would like to conclude my talk and to, um, to thank, uh, of course, everybody in, uh, in the Listen Lab, uh, Adrian Listen, that has been an amazing guide in this project, and um, the two people that uh, mainly run this project with me, Oliver and Carlos, and all the people that help out in the lab, and the amazing collaborator we have, and thank you to all of you for your attention, and I will be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you, Emanuela. That was a great talk. Great work. So we'll start with uh, the first question from Duyan Kim. What is the origin of the brain resident T cells? Are they from infiltration through the blood brain barrier or the brain lymphatic system and in meninges? Is there any chance that unperfused T cells contaminate the single cell RNA sequencing samples? That I'm, I'm produced. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, we don't, so to, to know where these cells are uh, coming from is actually the $100, under million dollar questions, uh, because in fact, we don't know where they are coming from. In fact, all these proposed sources are, are possible. So um, uh, in fact, uh, we also don't know uh, which is the molecule that allows the center, the cells to enter the brain. So what do we know? Um, from the prediction model, we know that <clears throat> the majority of the cells are entering the brain from the blood <clears throat> and the source of those cells are activated cells, cells in fact. But um, I would say around 30% of the cells, they are also locally, um, locally uh, expanded. So, but in fact, uh, we don't know exactly where they are coming from. So regarding the question about contamination, of course, this was also always our concern and we have been always very cautious about this. So what I can say for sure is that um, definitely we, we can exclude this is a blood contamination uh, as, I mean, blood cells express uh, a series of markers that are completely different from the blood. But I would say for us, like the C69 marker was like a black and white. Um, because blood cells really do not express this, the, the CD69 marker. And uh, also when we, we run the entropy statistic on the overall marker expression on those cells and we build the dendrogram for correlation, we could really see that while the brain areas or the brain tissue really correlate with each other, uh, the meninges and the blood really did not correlate with those tissues. Um, of course, we, we always made sure we remove meninges before performing the experiments. We also perfuse the brain. Um, so I, I'm, I would say I'm pretty confident. At least 90% of the cells come from the, from the brain parenchyma. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. The next question is from Sandro. This study is super interesting. Where, in your opinion, is the initial T cell priming necessary for brain entry happening? Some peripheral organs, meninges, choroid plexus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so, well, I would say that um, I, I don't think it's really important which would be uh, the, the, the tissue in which the, the cells are primed. So we, in fact, we tested the, um, we tested the gut so we in fact activated the cells in the gut and we saw that this in, induced a massive entry of the cells in the in the brain but i will not uh, so i cannot say for for stimulation in other tissues but um i mean i yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't exclude that this will not matter actually for the t-conventional but in fact, uh, I don't know the, the, the answer. Yeah. The next question is from Eugenio. What oral challenge with OVA would, would it lead to OT2 T cells to migrate to the brain? Is this also happening with CD8 T cells? Mm -hmm. 
I know that we checked, but in fact, I don't remember. But um, what I can tell you is that there has been a study from Kipnis Lab. So, and um, he used the MC class two, uh, sorry, he used the, the rack knockout mice. And then um, he injected, the, in, and he had a certain behavior, um, he had a deficiency in the Morris water mix. And then he tried to rescue this behavior using CD4 and CD8 primates with, the, with OVA or um, with MOG. And he could see that only the CD4 uh, were able to rescue. So, so, but anyway, so, but now, I mean, thinking back to your question, I mean, uh, in fact, in our model, so we don't really see that the, the CD4, the conventional, are going to the brain when we, we treat them with OVA, because in fact, they will require peripheral activation. So, I mean, I would think that CD8 would be the same, uh, and I'm sure we check. So if you are in, uh, if the person that asked the question is interested, uh, you can just drop me an email and I can have a look at the data actually, because we have the data, because we look at them. But in fact, I, I don't remember. Yeah. I guess we have uh, time for one more question. Um, I'll take this one from Emma. Do you think that MHC2 on microglia has any sort of microglia intrinsic role and is also required for microglial maturation? Um, yeah, so we get this question all the time. So yeah, in fact, um, so in, in our ends and in many published studies, so microglia, in fact, it does not express the MC class 2. So the MC class 2 is mostly expressed in activated microglia. But besides this, I mean, we can always say that maybe is necessary in early stages of development and so on. So we also confirm uh, the same finding on the microglia signature gene using the CTCR knockout mice. In fact, because we were worried about this. And, in, in, and as a parallel approach, we also use injection of the anti-CD4 antibody to deplete the CD4, and we always were able to recapitulate the same finding. So I don't think for the transition it, it, it is a problem because we use different approaches and some of them were MC class 2 unrelated and we still could confirm the same finding. Great. Thank you so much, Emanuela. Thank um, you very much. Before ending, I have a quick announcement to make. Could you stop sharing your slide, please? So um, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. It was really great. The audience was super engaging. Uh, the next Oakland Box Science Symposium will be AstroSci Focus. So people who are interested in this theme, please stay tuned and follow Open Box Sci Facebook or um, Twitter accounts for more details. It's going to happen at some point um, mid-September. And thank you everyone for coming. And I think Jerry wanted to take another screenshot yeah. of Akana's. So if speakers can stay on the, on the call. Jerry? Thank you all. Hey, yeah. Uh, um, is everyone ready? Yeah. Uh, wait a second. Uh, would you mind to stop sharing so oh, sorry. I can see you better? There you go. Yeah.